what's up everyone welcome to a new episode of it's lit it's dark as you can see today we are going to be working with a selection of poems by emily dickinson one of the most renowned writers of her era right she is really known because her poems were super expressive to the dark side of life all right uh, her story of life is really a tragic one uh, she never got married. She only she used to live alone, and very much of her time was spent in her um, in her bedroom writing. And curious thing is that after she died, her poems and writings were never published. It was her sister who found all of her literature, all of her writings, and ended up starting to publish them. Um, in newspapers of the time and that's how we finally found out how much rich literature she has she had written right um just wanted to give you guys that short introduction on Miss emily dickinson which has been uh one of uh the interests that i wanted to put in these classes now let's start with the lesson and of course we're going to start with our quick start activity and the first question for us to analyze of course as always we do these in class before watching the video is analyzing this question and answering with your own opinions in what ways do we seek to remain true to ourselves of course we had the time or we're going to have the time to answer these questions and you guys giving your opinion you can of course leave your opinion in the comment section if you're watching this video on youtube and also we're going to continue with the next part which is the quick start now emily dickinson cherished her independence all right do you always feel free to just be you or can you be influenced by others think about whether it is easy or difficult to stand up for what you believe in share your ideas with the class or again in the comments below once we are finished with this activity, we're going to continue with the theory, in fact, and we're going to analyze the themes and the structures in this selection of poems by Miss Dickinson. We gotta remind that the theme of a poem is its underlying message, okay? The message behind the poem, okay? That is what we call the theme. What is this poem about? What is the poem trying to communicate for the reader? The point the poet wants to make about life. Most often, the reader has to infer the theme from details in the poem. That's why we have to analyze and put our brains to think. In addition to her language, Dickinson uses elements of structure to convey important ideas and suggest different themes. And that's one of the beautiful things about poetry, a poem can not only be about one theme, it's not only about one thing, but you can actually have different interpretations. That's what we call ambiguity, right? When a text has different interpretations, different underlying messages, different purposes, right? So that's something that you can do very, very uh, specially with poetry. Now, what can we do? in order to understand structure and theme of a poem, well, you can use the following elements to help you determine what the theme is. Now, these are the elements of poetry. You can start with, it is arranged in verse, lines, or stanzas. Okay, and I want to uh, remind you what this is. A verse is normally determined by rhyme, but there are also verses that don't rhyme. That's what we call free verse. But when we do have a rhyme, we have to establish a pattern. And that pattern comes because of this sound. Now, this is important. Rhyme and verses are directly connected or related. And rhyme is established because of the sound of the last couple of syllables in a line. Right, so the arrangement of lines in a poem is called a verse or a stanza. So we can have two line stanzas, three line stanzas, four line stanzas, or we can actually have a poem that is one stanza, like 16, 25 lines. There are many examples of it. 
But what I wanted to explain is that the rhyme, okay, uh, or the versing will also have as an element of it the rhyme. The rhyme deals with the pronunciation, with the sound of the final uh, syllables in the lines, which will help us create a pattern, right? So we can have different types of patterns or we can actually have no pattern or, or at all. And that's what I was calling you, that's, that's what I was explaining before, just a few minutes ago, what a free verse poem is. In the end, it all comes to verses, lines, and stanzas, right? The, the second element uh, the poetry has, it's that it uses figurative language to convey ideas, right? The ideas are not literal. The ideas or the information is not quite there, um, explicit right now we have to read we have to understand uh what are the images that the author is trying to communicate through different words through uh representations through metaphors etc etc we're gonna get a little bit into those words in just a few minutes next uh the third element in poetry of course is that it has patterns of matter and right which is what i was just explaining all right Remember the rhyme, the matter, and the patterns. Okay, the patterns of matter of the patterns of matter and rhyme are directly connecting with the versing, with the stanzas. Well, sometimes we can have a very long uh, stanza, and to make it clear, a stanza would be would be the kind of paragraph in a poem. When the poem is separated in different groups of lines, that is not a paragraph. That is a stanza or a verse. Right? And again, the rhyme and the rhythm and these patterns are completely um, related to each other. And rhyme, we don't have to forget, is about how it sounds when somebody reads or um, say, speaks it out loud. All right, so there are three elements to take into consideration in order to help us figure out the theme which have and deal with the structure, which is verses, lines, or stanzas. The figurative language that is used and of course the patterns of matter or rhyme what is a stanza let's get down to business a little bit more specific a stanza is nothing but a group of lines that make up a paragraph in a poem again in poetry these uh, groups of lines are not paragraphs these are stanzas okay each stanza may express key, a key idea that develops the theme. And this is super important to take into consideration. Yes, there is a general idea overall in a poem, but what is customary in poetry is that every stanza conveys a specific or a main idea. You know, the same as it would, as would happen in prose with a paragraph that every paragraph is supposed to, to, to communicate a main idea, well, the same happens with each stanza in a poem. Each of them will most surely convey or communicate a specific idea or a key idea that when you combine all of them, you're gonna finally understand or come up with what the theme, the general theme is of the poem. Dashes. And this is very typical of Dickinson. She uses the dash in a variety of ways, including to denote an interruption or an abrupt shift in thought for emphasis or to just denote, denote uncertainty or indecision. We have to think about how those dashes can affect the interpretation, not only of the poem or the verse or the stanza, but the whole theme in the poem. Um, not many poets or writers make the use of the dash as Emily Dickinson does, and she does it with a specific purpose. As you can see, she will convey interruptions, emphasis, or many different other purposes, as long as we can go in the end and analyze the main idea of the theme in the poem. Then we got to know the rhyme scheme. Again, rhyme is the occurrence of identical or similar sounds at the ends of words, specifically in the words that end the lines that make up a stanza. In addition to being a sound device, rhyming words can serve to make emphasis and important, on important ideas and concepts. When we read, we have to notice how Dickinson uses the structure 
as well as the language to develop the themes of her poems. You may be thinking, well, how is the organization or the structure of a poem going to help me understand the theme? And here's a, a tip that I can give you. When you see a poem that visually is very well organized, and you can see that every stanza has four lines, and you can see that's five, six, or seven stanzas, all of them four lines with their commas, with their periods, with their capital letters, you will see that it's organized. It's a very neat, it's actually appealing to your view when you see it from afar without even reading. That is a message. It's an organized poem. The information or the theme may be something very neutral or very, you know, uh, static. But it, whenever you, you get to see one of Emily's poems that has dashes all over, spaces, capitalizations, quotation marks, one stanza is four lines, the next one is two, the next one is only one line, the next one has five. So you're going to see that it's a little bit more chaotic. And that, my friend, is also part of the purpose of using these different uh, devices, for example, the dash, um, spacing, etc., etc., that will actually give you a first glance at a poem. You say, wow, that is um, catastrophic. That is a whole chaos in the poem without even seeing. And when you start reading it, you start uh, experiencing the rhyme patterns, etc., you will, of course, understand that it's all connected and it's part of the theme that she wants to convey, right? In this lesson, we're also going to analyze figurative language, which is uh, the type of language that com communicates ideas beyond the literal meaning of the words. That's when we use a word outside its context in order to communicate a different idea that the word itself wants to define or signify. Dickinson, Miss Emily Dickinson, uses figurative language to add engagement to her poems and also to convey important relevant ideas. We're going to study uh, the types of figurative language that we have in this chart. And then we're going to, of course, make examples at the end of the lesson after we finish the video, okay? I, uh, we're going to see the examples of each of them uh, from Dickinson poems. Now, we have here definitions and examples. We're going to start with a metaphor. What is a metaphor? A metaphor is a comparison of two unlike things that have something in common, and that is my friends the key. These two things that I'm comparing have something in common. It may be uh, explicit or not, all right? Look at the example, the perils in your mouth. Of course, we're talking about a person's teeth, but if we think about the concept of metaphor, which is two things that are un unlike, but they have something in common, what do teeth and pearls have in common? The color. They're valuable. For a person, their teeth have to be valuable. And of course, pearls are also kind of a precious you know, object. So they have several things in common, all right? So that's why we can make a metaphor of teeth saying that they are perils in someone's mouth, right? On the second um, element of figurative language that we're gonna be studying is the simulate or simulates. Uh, they are, again, they are also comparisons, but we have to use specifically and uh, very strictly the words like or the words like or the words as. If the simile or if the device, okay, the, the, the language device, the, the simulator doesn't have the word like or the word as, it's not a simulator, my friends, and that's it, okay? So again, it's a comparison. You can feel also metaphorical, but if you see that the sentence or the clause has the word like or the word as in order to connect them, to connect two ideas, that, my friends, is a simulator, all right? This use the words like or as of two unlike things that have something in common. If you check the two definitions between metaphor and simile, they are pretty much the same. But for similes, we have to use the word as or the word like. Examples, he is strong as a lion. 
that is a simile. But if I say, oh, he is a lion because he is very strong, well, that is a metaphor. See the difference? She is like a pearl in the ocean. That is a simile. Oh, she's a pearl in the ocean of my heart. That is a metaphor. Last but not least, in the lesson, we're also going to work with personification. The word itself kind of self-explains, but it's just the giving of human qualities to an object, an animal, an idea, or an abstract concept. There's also a word for personification that is uh, anthropomor anthrop anthropomorphism. All right? We're not going to use that one. We're just going to stay with personification. Personification, again, it's giving human characteristics to something that is not human, all right? For example, we could see the smile on the sun. Well, we could see the smile of the sun in the morning. The clouds were happy and dancing around. The birds were singing with a beautiful voice. All of those are examples of personifications, all right? Because we're giving characteristics of human characteristics to objects, subjects that are not, all right? So basically, uh, those are the elements that we're gonna be studying, we're gonna be working with, we're gonna be you know, analyzing here and there in the next uh, couple of lessons that we're gonna have. We're gonna have active reading. Uh, make sure you leave a comment, make sure you leave a like, um, subscribe to the channel, and of course, click on notifications. I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.